Apologies. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Katherine Longmire, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Office of Education, along with the National Sea Grant College Program, where I work, and is supported by Woods Hole Sea Grant and NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network. All of our speakers uh, work for some part of NOAA, and that's N-O-A-A. Or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today we are introducing you to Vincent Saba at NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center, who will talk about how fish and sea turtles are dealing with warming oceans. Before we start, we'd like to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional knowledge to share with us. We acknowledge that Vincent is coming to us from the territories of the Lenni Lenape people, and we're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Pamunkey and Chickahominy tribes. And I also want to extend a special thank you to our American Sign Language interpreters, Crystal Butler and Annabelle Stone. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Vincent, you're all muted. However, there's a chat box where you can write questions, and we encourage you to do that as we go along. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, no worries. We're gonna give you some resources so you can look things up after. Also, Vincent has generously agreed to answer questions we don't get to, and we will post the answers along with the recording of today's webinar on our website. Vincent is also going to have some questions for you throughout the webinar, so get ready to type. All right, so I'm set. Uh, so I will set, I will turn it over to Vincent. Take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay still? Audio good? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody uh, for joining. A good afternoon for those folks who are on the US East Coast. Uh, it's four o'clock here in uh, New Jersey. Uh, again, my name is Vince Saba. I work for NOAA Fisheries in the Northeast. Um, however, I do sit at a NOAA Climate Lab located at Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. So a lot of my uh, research as a scientist involves understanding climate impacts on fish and sea turtles. Uh, next slide, please. So I grew up in Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia. Um, I lived there for about 27 years before I moved to Virginia. Um, as a kid, um, I always liked uh, math and science. In fact, there's the picture of me here on the right-hand side. Uh, it was when I was 10 years old, back in 1985, and um, I had a love for computers and coding. Um, that's an old Apple IIe machine, which is... Uh, Folks don't use those machines anymore. You can see the disk drives there and the old monitor. Um, but I did fall in love with math and science at a young age. And then in middle school, uh, I took an astronomy class and I thought I wanted to be an astronomer until I got to high school. And I took a marine biology class when I was 17 in my senior year and uh, became very interested uh, in ocean science. But growing up as a kid, I used to go fishing with my dad, uh, grandfather and uncle in the Delaware Bay for uh, blue crabs and summer flounder. So um, I always had a fascination with uh, with the oceans. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Drexel University in Philadelphia. I also did a master's degree there. Uh, in fact, for my master's degree, I worked on freshwater turtles. So you look at the left-hand side of your screen, uh, that small that uh, picture in the middle there is a snapping turtle. And I tracked turtles uh, in a freshwater impoundment near the Philadelphia airport. Uh, and then I moved to Virginia when I was about 27 years old, and I studied leatherback sea turtles, shown the bottom left uh, figure there. Uh, in Costa Rica. So uh, I, I lived in Costa Rica for a while, conducted research on leatherback sea turtles, um, and I got my PhD from the Virginia Center of Marine Science, and then moved back to New Jersey to do a postdoctoral uh, research project at Princeton University, which then brought me to NOAA. So I now work for NOAA Fisheries. Next slide, please. So just to give you all a brief primer, since I, a brief primer on uh, global warming, because I'll be talking about warming oceans, sea turtles, and fish, um, I want to give you all a sense of why our planet is warming. So this is a really helpful figure from uh, the, the NASA website, climate.nasa.gov. Um, and this essentially is showing you how the greenhouse effect works um, on our planet. So there are these long-lived greenhouse gases that make up uh, part of our atmosphere. So without our atmosphere, the Earth would be very, very cold. So as the sun is uh, generating, uh, producing um, solar radiation, the Earth then absorbs that radiation, but also some of that radiation is reflected back up. 
and gets trapped within our atmosphere, which keeps our planet warm uh, so that we can actually live. And so over the past hundred years or so, um, humans have been producing excess carbon dioxide, which is another long lived greenhouse gas. It's not the most abundant greenhouse gas. Water vapor is actually the most abundant greenhouse gas. But carbon dioxide uh, is being produced in excess from human activity, things like driving our motor vehicles, um, burning natural gas. So that carbon dioxide then, uh, that excess carbon dioxide reaches the atmosphere and traps more of that heat that's being reflected uh, back up from the land. So that's why our planet has been warming um, over the past 100 years or so due to climate, uh, human activity. Next slide, please. So to give you a sense of how much the surface of the planet has warmed, uh, this figure here is showing surface temperature warming. This is, a, this is the surface temperature above land and oceans since the year 1884. And this figure is in degrees Fahrenheit. So the areas in red are areas that have warmed since 1884, and the areas in blue are regions that have cooled. And on the left panel, you're seeing the uh, planet Earth's warming since uh, in the year 1975. And on the right, you're seeing the warming in the year 2020. And as you can see, there's a substantial amount of warming in the year 2020 uh, since the year 1884, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere above the Arctic. So my first question for everybody is, why is there more warming in the Arctic relative to the South Pole? So the North Pole warming versus the South Pole, why is there more warming um, in the North Pole? That's a great question to think about. Why, uh, why do you guys think? You can type your responses into the chat box. So Theodore says, because the earth is tilted. Okay, interesting. I like it, I like it. Uh, Mich Michelle says, because the earth is or closer to atmosphere. Kate says, ocean currents. Um, Theodore says, or maybe because the ice is melting. Um, oh. And it's cloud cover. Uh, Alice and Paul say more people in the northern hemisphere. And a good uh, Rachel says, because there aren't as many carbon sinks. So uh, let's hmm. let's find out here. Yeah. So the so one of the so someone got it right. I think you said it was Theo that said that because of the ice melt. So that is exactly right. So. The reason why we're seeing, we're observing more warming in um, the North Pole over the Arctic compared to the South Pole is because there's been much more sea ice loss um, in the Arctic relative to the Antarctic in the South. And so because ice uh, essentially has this albedo effect where it the more ice you have, uh, the more whiteness you have, the more it reflects that solar radiation uh, and keeps things cooler. And because there's been more ice melt in the Arctic, that's why things have warmed more so in the North relative to the South. And so you might ask why that is. Well, in the Arctic, essentially you have uh, an, an Arctic ocean surrounded by land, but in the South Pole, it's essentially a continent or land surrounded by water, which you'll be able to see in the next slide. So a uh, very good answer to the person that got that right. That's exactly right. It's also known as Arctic amplification. That's the other term that we use. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now let's move on to the oceans. Um, so. It turns out that about 90% of that excess heat that I was talking about in my previous slide that's being generated through this excess carbon dioxide being emitted into the atmosphere due to human activity, about 90% of that excess heat is being absorbed by our oceans. And so what this figure is showing you is how much of that excess heat is actually being absorbed in terms of energy. So this is in watts per meter squared. So the upper 2000 feet of the ocean here where you see areas that are red are where the oceans are essentially warming more than average and areas where you see blue uh, are areas that have been cooling but what you can see is that uh, where i'm at over here in new jersey in north uh, the northeast coast of uh, the us we've experienced an enhanced warming in our oceans you can also see some excess warming in the western pacific as well but the oceans are absorbing a lot of this excess heat that's being generated uh, if you can toggle to the, the right arrow please next slide so the first uh, then my talk is gonna be divided into two major parts. The first part, I'll be talking about fish in the Northwest Atlantic, but I'm also gonna be talking about leatherback turtles nesting on the west coast of Costa Rica and how they may be impacted by future ocean um, and global, future ocean warming and future climate change. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll also be talking about loggerhead sea turtles in the Northwest Atlantic um, and also a few different species of fish and how uh, ocean warming has impacted those animals and how we're 
um, how we expect changes to continue among turtles and fish. Next slide, please. So how can climate change or global warming affect marine life? So it can, it can be very complicated, but in some sense, if we just look at how uh, fish and fisheries can be impacted for the sake of this talk, uh, we can expect as the oceans warm that we can uh, observe changes in where fish are today versus where they'll be 25 to 30 years from now. And we can also assess uh, where fish are, have how much they've actually moved based on our surveys that we use where we're surveying uh, the ocean to see where fish were caught 20, 30 years ago versus where they're caught today. So because fish are ectotherms or cold blooded, we do expect them to move as ocean temperatures change, but ocean warming is not the only impact from climate change. We can also expect the oceans to become more acidic. So as the oceans absorb more of that carbon dioxide, they actually become more acidic. And that could have consequences for shell building animals like scallops, clams, lobsters, and other types of shellfish. Um, we can also expect size reductions. Some fish may get bigger in warming water, some fish may um, get smaller. So that uh, those impacts of climate change combined with other human activities such as pollution, um, overfishing, coastal development, can also have these what we call synergistic or combined effects of both climate change and other human activities. So the resulting consequences, we can expect ecosystems to be disrupted, marine ecosystems, um, potentially higher operational costs for fish uh, for fisheries, um, and also changes on uh, changes in the types of fish that uh, fisheries are targeting. Next slide, please. So at this point, I think it's a good time to stop for any questions that anyone in the audience might have before we continue. That is perfect timing because we actually just got our first question. Um, Mark asks, why would some fish grow but others shrink in response to global warming? Great question. So in some sense, you know, fish that are adapted to, for example, cooler water, as the ocean um, warms in their natural habitat, their growth efficiency can change. So under warming conditions, um, fish may actually grow uh, less efficient um, under warming conditions and therefore actually grow smaller. Um, larger, and the other, the other uh, I forgot to mention, um, which I should also point out, is also their food resources could change. So it, under warming conditions or even cooling conditions, if a particular fish uh, species food resources uh, become more resourceful or less resourceful can also impact their growth rates. So that's a really good question. Wow, cool. Um, oh, cool, great. We've got one other question. Is the very little amount of snow we get each year because of warming water? And Theodore asked that. So I guess that, that's, so that, that question is relative to where you're located. Um, because some places are getting more snow than they used to, and some places are getting less. Um, and we do expect that with climate change. So with climate change, um, scientists don't expect everything to change the same. So whereas one place gets a certain amount of snow, um, that could be an increase or decrease depending on where in the world uh, you live. Great, um, let's keep going. Okay. And then, and we'll have another chance for questions. Okay, you got it. Next slide, please. Okay, so for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on marine fish and sea turtles. Um, I do, I have studied uh, both of these. Uh, I've studied sea turtles uh, a large part of my career, but I also um, have been studying various types of fish species over the last 10 years since working for NOAA Fisheries. And so sea turtles and, and marine fish, they have a, a lot of commonalities, a lot of similarities, but there's also differences. So in terms of how they're similar, uh, both fish and sea turtles are what we call cold-blooded or also termed as ectotherms, which means their body temperatures are typically uh, about the same as the environment. So whether that environment is the ocean or um, the air around them. However, there are some exceptions, for example, large leatherback sea turtles like the one shown here. As these turtles are much bigger than your average sea turtle, um, they are able to regulate their body temperature so that their core organs can actually be warmer than their outside um, parts of their body, for example, where their flippers are at. Um, even larger uh, uh, marine fish, for example, for example, tuna, can also regulate temperature uh, near their eyes where they need uh, warmer temperatures. Great white sharks, for example, can also uh, be warmer than average around their stomach area. So uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the rule for all these species, but the majority are in fact cold-blooded. So that's where they're similar. In terms of where they're different, uh, marine fish have to, they, they spend all their life in the ocean. They have to lay their eggs in the ocean, they spawn in the ocean. 
sea turtles have to lay their eggs on dry land or what we call nesting beaches. So to these dry sandy beaches. And once those eggs are put in place, they're static. So turtles are living most of their, marine turtles are living most of their life in the ocean, but they have to lay their eggs on dry land. So that's a major difference between marine fish and sea turtles. Next slide, please. So to give you an example of what we've observed in terms of marine fish moving as oceans are warming, I'm gonna give you an example here in the Northeast US. So what you can see here is, um, uh, this is the Northeast US and these red areas for this particular fish species called black sea bass, uh, shown in the picture here, this is a, what we consider a warmer water fish uh, for the North, oh, can you go back one slide, thank you, uh, for the Northeast US. All these red areas are where we've seen an increase in the uh, habitat of black sea bass. So our NOAA surveys go out every fall and spring, we sample the ocean, and we're able to detect changes in the distribution of particular fish species. And this particular case for black sea bass, a warmer water fish, as the Northeast US has been warming, we've been, we've been seeing an increase more so uh, to the fact that these fish are becoming more inshore and also a bit further to the north. Next slide, please. So conversely, for a colder water fish, uh, this example is for Atlantic cod, same region, the Northeast US. And what you can see here is that you see lots of blue relative to the black sea bass in the previous slide. So this particular cold water fish has been losing habitat um, as the ocean has been warming in the Northeast US over about the last 20 to 25 years or so. And this figure on the bottom right here essentially shows the probability of catching Atlantic cod is highest at about eight degrees centigrade um, ocean bottom temperature, which is really cold. That's almost near freezing. So this is a cold water fish um, that has been negatively responding to these warming ocean temperatures. Next slide, please. So how can we um, forecast or what we call project potential future changes in fish habitat as the ocean uh, continues to warm? So in the climate research world, we use climate models to forecast or project long-term changes um, in the Earth system. So in this particular case, we are forecasting future ocean temperatures, and then we build what we call these fish habitat models, which can then be driven by changes in ocean temperature. So what you can see on the left slide here, on the left panel here where it says present day, this is the present day habitat of this cold water fish, Atlantic cod, and all the red areas are where there's um, good habitat for this particular species. So red means good, blue means not so good in terms of uh, preferred water temperatures. Now, if you look to the right side, this is the projected habitat for this particular species. And what you can see is that there's very, very little habitat available to this particular cold water fish by the end of the century or between the years 2075 and 2100. So almost about 75 years into the future, we're projecting very little habitat left for this cold water fish um, in the Northeast US as temperatures are projected to warm. Next slide, please. So conversely, on the opposite side, for a warm water fish like black sea bass, as I discussed earlier, if you look at the present day habitat versus the future or the projected or forecasted habitat on the right hand side, you can see a general expansion of habitat. So you're seeing more red in toward the north, of, uh, closer to Boston. You're also seeing more red closer to shore. So a general inshore movement uh, for this particular species. So very different than the future uh, that we showed for the cold water fish in the previous slide. Next slide, please. So another way we can try to understand how changes in fish distribution can affect fisheries, um, we can also look at, at how species distribution um, changes relative to some of the major fishing ports along the Northeast US. So on the left side here, you're seeing some of the major ports uh, up from, from Portland, Maine, um, down through uh, Virginia and Cape May, New Jersey and you're seeing three different species of commercial fish that are typically caught in Northeast uh, US. So the green is Atlantic croaker, which is um, a, a not so valuable fish. Uh, in the middle is summer flounder, also known as fluke, which is kind of a moderate uh, valued fish. And then the purple is American lobster, which is a highly valuable, thought valuable fish. It's, it's cost much more uh, to eat lobster than it does Atlantic croaker. So what you can see is that where there's these open circles, this is about where these fish uh, species are being caught today. And then the closed solid circles are where they're projected to be caught uh, about 75 years into the future. And you can see that for all three of these species, there's a general northern shift as the, ocean the oceans can are projected to, uh, to warm. Um, 
throughout the Northeast US. So what does this mean for, for, for fisheries? Well, it means that some of these ports will be closer to more valuable species, some will be further away. This has implications for fuel costs. Um, it can also uh, determine which fish, which fish species a particular fisheries um, tries to catch or what we call their target species. So, um, you know, I think one note of caution here is that we're only considering changes in ocean temperature. We're not accounting for changes in fisheries behavior or new sp species interactions. This is a very uh, simple way of trying to understand how climate change uh, can affect fish and fisheries. Next slide, please. So conversely for sea turtles, we have to not only look at changes in their habitat in the ocean, but we also have to look at changes uh, in their nesting beaches where they lay their eggs. As I mentioned before, female turtles have to lay their eggs in dry substrate um, or dry land, typically sandy beaches. Now, the interesting thing about sea turtles is that the temperature at which the eggs incubate at on these beaches determines how many male turtles versus how many female turtles are produced. This is called sex uh, temperature dependent sex determination. So typically among sea turtles, at cooler temperatures, more male or boy turtles are produced. And then at warmer temperatures, more female or more girl temp uh, turtles are produced. And so typically most sea turtle populations are already female biased, meaning that most of the turtles are females within these populations. There's a small proportion of males. So under warming conditions, we do expect possibly more females produced in a warming world. However, we also need to consider changes in mortality. So in other words, how many eggs actually hatch? And what we found is that, especially beaches in Costa Rica and some other areas, as beaches continue to warm, less and less of those hatchlings actually emerge from nests, which actually could be a larger impact than changes in the male to female ratio. And then you can see on the, on the, on the uh, bottom right figure here, when we track these turtles in the ocean with satellite transmitters, when the females leave the nesting beaches, we also track males uh, that are captured in water. You can see they're utilizing large portions of the ocean. So we have to consider not just changes in small parts of the ocean, but almost the entire ocean basin. For example, leatherback turtles here in the North Atlantic, they're using large parts of the ocean. So we have to be cognizant of changes in the ocean environment as well. Next slide, please. So the uh, case study, the example I'm gonna give you all today um, are for my favorite animal, which, are the, which is the leatherback turtle. Um, I did my PhD on leatherback turtles, and I also did some postdoctoral work at Princeton on leatherback turtles, and I still work with these turtles today. And so the leatherback turtle population that I'll talk about today nests on the northwest coast of Costa Rica at a place called Playa Grande, Costa Rica on the Pacific coasts. And these are the largest sea turtles in the world. So if there's anyone out there that knows anything about leatherback turtles, I'd like to ask the audience, what do you think leatherback turtles eat? What's their favorite food? Oh, and we have an answer already. Theodora says jellyfish. Texas uh, also says jellyfish. Very good. Uh, Aura says squid. Okay. Uh, we have Meredith says jellyfish. Melissa says kelp. And Samantha says kelp as well. All right. Well, you're. What does it sound? You guys are two for two. So jellyfish is correct. So the interesting thing about this animal is that being the largest sea turtle uh, in the world, they eat an animal, jellyfish, which is 90% water, 85 to 90% water. So what does that tell you? They have to eat a lot of jellyfish to get that big. Um, but yes, that is right. They eat primarily uh, jellyfish, or what we also call gelatinous zooplankton. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so for this particular sea turtle leatherback population in Costa Rica, um, after years and years of monitoring the nesting beaches, the nice thing about sea turtles, unlike fish, we can really get a good sense of how many female turtles, uh, nesting female turtles are out there because they simply uh, crawl up out of the ocean onto beaches and we can count them. Um, with fish populations, it's much more difficult to assess how many eggs populations are producing um, or, or what we call spawning stock biomass. We have to rely on very small samples throughout the ocean, and we also rely on models uh, to get an idea of how many fish are out there. Uh, with female sea turtles, we simply count them when they come up to nest. So in Costa Rica, this has been going on for decades in this particular beach on the northwest coast of Costa Rica. And what we found was that there are these periods uh, uh, that, that are called uh, ENSO events. And this essentially is natural climate variables. So some of you may have heard of El Ninos and La Ninos. 
Well, these derive from the Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean. And so during an El Nino period, which you can see in the top left here, there's apparently less food in the ocean for these turtles. And we can measure that uh, from satellites. Satellites can look at the color of the ocean. And the more green the ocean is, that means the more phytoplankton or algae is in the ocean. Um, and that gives you a sense of how much food can be produced. So okay, phytoplankton at the bottom of the food chain and jellyfish are feeding on uh, zooplankton, which feed on phytoplankton. It gives us a sense of how much leatherback food is actually out there. So during El Nino periods, we find that there's less food in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And then conversely, during La Nina periods on the bottom here, we find that there's possibly more food for leatherback turtles. So we find that there's more turtles coming back to nest after these more productive La Nina events. But we've also found that on the, uh, back on the nesting beaches in Costa Rica, that during these El Nino events, conditions are both warmer, but they're also drier. They're getting less rainfall. And that has negative consequences for the eggs. We find that there's not only less males being produced because the temperatures are warmer, but we also find that less baby turtles are emerging from nests during these warm periods. Um, so that can give us a sense of how continued climate change and global warming can affect this particular population of sea turtle. Next slide, please. So at this point, I think it's a good time to stop for any questions from the audience. Yes, and we've got some good ones. So um, let's see, we've got uh, one question on leatherback turtles. So how do they avoid being stung if they're eating jellyfish? Great question. So leatherbacks, because they've been around for just about 90 million years, not too long, right? These turtles have been around since the dinosaurs. They've evolved um, so that they are not affected um, by stinging jellyfish. They can eat jellyfish that would sting you and swing in the ocean, but they could swallow it whole and have no problems at all. They've adapted to be able to eat these uh, types of animals. Great question. Oh, cool. So market us mark it that. Um, we have another, we have a few leatherback sea turtle questions. Um, how many eggs does a female leatherback lay? Michelle asks. Another great question. So it depends on um, which ocean the leatherback lives in. So if it's an Atlantic Ocean leatherback, we have found that those leatherbacks typically produce more eggs, somewhere around 80 to 90 eggs possibly. In the Pacific Ocean, particularly Eastern Pacific and Costa Rica, um, the population that I'm discussing today, they're producing between 60 to 70 eggs per nest. So remember, a leatherback turtle, like most sea turtles, will nest every couple of weeks. Um, we call that clutch frequency. So they'll come up to nest, uh, lay 60 to 90 eggs, go back in the ocean for uh, another week or so, maybe 10 days, and come back to the beach and lay another 60 to 90 eggs. Great question. And Melissa also asks, how big do leather leatherback turtles get? Another good question. And again, it's also relative to the ocean. So it turns out that Atlantic leatherback turtles are bigger than Eastern Pacific leatherback turtles. Um, the biggest turtle that I've ever seen nesting was about 165 centimeters in what we call carapace length. So from the top, the shell where it meets the neck of the turtle to the very bottom was about 165 centimeters. So pretty wow. big. Do you know what that is in inches? That's probably close to about, let's see, three feet and a meter. We're probably talking close to about just over five feet in length. And that's just the shell length. So five feet. Big, I am five feet myself. That is crazy. Yeah. Pretty big turtle. And they can weigh over, they can weigh over a ton. And they can weigh over a ton. That's amazing. Um, okay, let's see. Let's do a couple more questions. We've got a, I've got a lot of questions, but um, Samantha asks, are all sea turtles endangered or are leatherbacks not endangered? Another great question. So as it turns, it depends on which ocean you're talking about. So leatherbacks in the Pacific Ocean, um, there are few turtles, there, there, are, there are fewer leatherback turtles in the Pacific, particularly the Eastern Pacific, relative to turtles in the Atlantic Ocean and even in the uh, Southern Indian Ocean. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what exactly is going on there. Um, it could be a combination of um, incidental interaction with fisheries um, off of South America. Uh, it could also be a combination of climate factors. And, um, you know, it turns out that the ones in Eastern Pacific, so to just to give you an example, when I worked at that nesting beach in Costa Rica um, in the early 2000s, so about 20 years ago, we were getting anywhere from 250 to 400 female turtles per year nesting. Uh, today, in that same nesting beach, um, they're lucky if they get 10 turtles nesting in a single mm -hmm. season. 
so in a single year. So we've seen dramatic changes in the Pacific population relative to the Atlantic populations, which seem to be mostly stable. Wow. All right, we've got uh, two more questions that I'll combine into one um, on El Nino or La Nina. So Theodore asks, is it El Nino or La Nina right now? And then Camille asks, can El Nino, La Nina help predict the number of nests laid in a given year? Great questions. So the first part, uh, I think, and don't quote me on this, I think we're heading into a La Nina. I'm not exactly sure, or what we might be what we call ENSO neutral. Um, but if you check out the NOAA or the climate.gov website, there should be information that you can find on El Nino. But you're right, it is measured in the Eastern Pacific, yeah. Um, and that is tracked every day. And then the second part was, I think it was, can we predict or uh, use the ENSO index, El, Ni El Ninos and La Ninas, to predict? Yes, yeah, so that that's actually was part of my PhD research um, way back 14 years ago. Uh, I actually helped create a model that predicts how many nesting females would come each year or the next year based on current El Nino, La Nina conditions. And the model worked pretty well. We were able to predict if we were going to have a higher than average year or a lower than average year. But today, because there's so few turtles, leatherback turtles nesting uh, on the west coast of Costa Rica uh, and across other parts of the eastern Pacific, like Mexico, that we don't really find some of those climate relationships with ENSO because there are just so few turtles, leatherback turtles nesting at these nesting beaches. We see other species mm -hmm. of sea turtles nesting there now instead of leatherback turtles. So something is going on. Something's going on, yeah. Something's going on. Well, lovely. Well, we've got more questions, but we'll save them um, for the end. And so, and that was all the leatherback sea turtle questions. So let's uh, let's move on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to shift gear, shift locations back to the U.S. Northeast here. Um, so what I'm showing here, this is a loggerhead sea turtle. So before we were talking about leatherback sea turtles, now I'm going to shift gears and talk about loggerhead sea turtles. So loggerhead sea turtles are smaller than leatherback turtles, still relatively big for a sea turtle, bigger than other sea turtles. Um, they have a wider variety of, of food that they eat. They have, a, they have a, a, um, a diet that can consist of jellyfish, uh, hard shell animals, crabs, shellfish. They also can uh, swim to the very bottom and eat, you know, basically dead animals, what we call detritus. Um, so they have a more varied diet than leatherback turtles um, and different, different ecology as well. And we've been tracking these turtles in the U.S. Northeast for quite a while now. And by tracking them in the ocean using satellite tags, we're able to get a sense of which, what is their preferred water temperature. And so we can build a model um, just like we did for fish in those earlier slides. And we can also forecast or project how loggerhead turtles may respond to continued ocean warming. And no surprise, what we found was that if you look at the bottom figure here, the red areas indicate um, what we would call good loggerhead turtle habitat, and then blue areas would be not so good. So red is good, blue is not so good. And what you can see is that as the ocean uh, is projected or forecasted to warm going from your left to right, you can see more and more loggerhead turtle habitat moving into the north. So more loggerhead turtle habitat into the Gulf of Maine um, as the ocean is projected to warm. So that could, that could actually potentially be a good thing for these particular turtles. Um, however, as I mentioned earlier, we still believe that the beach impacts might be stronger than what we're seeing uh, or what, what, could, what could potentially change in the ocean. So in terms of how many hatchings are produced um, under current conditions versus 100 years from now when things will obviously be much warmer. Uh, next slide, please. However, if we look at these two species of sea turtles, so loggerheads on the left and leatherback turtles on the right, these two figures here, all these red dots are showing the major nesting locations for loggerhead turtles on the left and leatherback turtles on the right. The dark blue areas are where these turtles typically occupy their ocean, their, their ocean habitat uh, is, is suggested to exist. But what I want you to focus on are the red dots. So if you look at the loggerhead sea turtle on the left-hand side, and look at the, um, the black dotted line here, this, this horizontal line, you can see that loggerhead turtles are nesting today already further north than leatherback turtles. So leatherback turtles have a narrower range, more of a tropical range where they're nesting relative to loggerhead turtles. And some of the data suggests that loggerhead turtles may be starting to expand their uh, nesting grounds further north um, along the, the uh, southeast coast of the United States. 
So what does that mean for climate change? So it could mean that leatherback turtles, which are typically a warmer area or tropical nester, may be um, more impacted by climate change, whereas loggerhead turtles, because they have a wider range of nesting grounds, nesting in cooler environments, um, and they may be able to expand their nesting grounds further north, may be able to deal with the warming um, a little better than leatherback turtles. But we need more research and more data to understand these differences. Next slide, please. So to summarize, we found that there are similarities, but also differences between marine fish and sea turtles. Again, uh, marine fish spend all of their life in the ocean. Sea turtles spend the majority of their life uh, in the ocean, but they have to lay their eggs on dry land. Um, we've been able to study sea turtles more. Um, we have a lot more data on sea turtle uh, nesting and their egg ecology, their nesting ecology, than we do for um, fish because fish live their life 100% in the water. It is much more difficult for us to measure how many fish are being produced relative to sea turtles where they're just coming up on nesting beaches and we can go out there as scientists, count eggs, count turtles, um, and collect the data. Uh, in terms of ocean change, we also see similarities. So for warmer water uh, sea turtles that like warmer water as oceans are projected and they're continuing to warm, we do expect this um, increase in range or this increase in habitat um, shifts to new waters potentially. Um, this may not be the case for all sea turtles, but for some of these species that I showed today, we do expect these range expansions for sea turtles. Next slide, please. So what can you do to help sea turtles? Well, there's, there's many things you can do. Um, I didn't include fish here because it's much easier to discuss about things you can do as um, elementary and middle school kids to help sea turtles. So one of the major things you can do is, and I, I can't uh, stress this enough, is don't release helium balloons uh, into the atmosphere. And the reason why, as we discussed earlier, uh, a lot of these turtles, loggerheads and leatherbacks, eat jellyfish. And so when these balloons land in the water, they can actually look like a jellyfish. And so if a turtle accidentally eats one of these balloons, it can actually kill them. So on the left here, you can see a jellyfish on the right and a plastic bag on the left. Um, and balloons can do the same thing. So another thing you can do to help sea turtles is to reduce your use of plastic or even plastic straws. Because if these things make their way into the ocean, um, they can potentially harm animals like sea turtles. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues, um, there's a video out there floating on YouTube, I'm sure some of you may have seen it, of a biologist removing a plastic straw from a, sea a nesting sea turtle's no uh, nose, their nost uh, her nostril. Um, the sea turtle tried to probably ingest it and it got caught in the nose and it was able, fortunately the straw was, uh, they were able to remove, remove the object. Um, so these are things that you can do to help sea turtles. Uh, next slide, please. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Uh, these are pictures of my, my two boys. On the left is my older son, Dean. This is when he's now thir almost 13, but this is when he was uh, four years old. Uh, he's holding, this is him in Costa Rica, holding an Eastern Pacific green turtle, a baby turtle, a hatchling. And the right picture is my six-year-old, uh, Kellen. Uh, this is him with his Yoda ears looking into the, through the aquarium glass uh, at, at the aquarium at Epcot. So thank you very much, folks, and I'd be happy to uh, take any further questions. That is so sweet. Look at that baby turtle. That is tiny. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your talk. And we've got a few questions. Let's see. I'm going to circle back um, real fast to fish. And then we've got some, some more sea turtle talk, um, questions. Sure. Alice and Paul had asked, uh, are the cold water fish gaining habitat somewhere else? We hear that they're losing all this yeah. habitat, but are right. they really gaining it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, unfortunately, you know, we've observed with the ocean warming, most areas have been warming. So typically with colder water fish, we're either seeing them uh, shift poleward. So when I say poleward, I don't want to use the word north because if you're in the Southern hemisphere and you're a cold water fish, you're going to shift south. So closer to the poles um, in, the hemis uh, in either the North or Southern, he Southern hemisphere. However, we're also finding that colder water fish can seek colder refuge in deeper water. Right, so you know that does give them one advantage to land animals is that can shift to deeper water to access that colder water refuge, um, you know, as opposed to sh simply shifting poleward. So unfortunately, we have seen mostly contractions in cold water fish habitat, and typically more typically expansions in warm uh, warmer fish warmer water fish habitat. Great question. 
Thanks. And then um, Adrian had asked, how do the hat, the going back to the sea turtles, um, how do the hatchlings find their way out to sea? Yeah, that, that's another great question. So uh, we think there's multiple cues they use. However, um, we find that the hatchlings are very, very sensitive to both light and also sound. So they can cue in on the sounds of the waves, the sounds of the ocean, but also um, they're very sensitive to light. So for some of you that might be familiar with, or for some of you that maybe live in the southern portions of the United States, uh, particularly in Florida or the Carolinas, um, there are rules where if for folks that live near sea turtle nesting beaches, they have to turn down their lights or use special red filtered lights near their homes that are close to the beach so that when baby sea turtles are hatched, they don't get confused by the lights of homes and go the wrong way, go toward the, the road or, you know, behind the beach as opposed to going to the ocean. Um, they also use the reflection of the moonlight on the ocean as a cue, uh, but sea turtles don't always hatch when the moon is out or, or you know, when, when, when the sky is lit by, uh, by the moon. Um, but yes, both light and sound we think they use. They also might be using the vibrations, the vibrations of the waves um, on the ocean. And they also use um, uh, geomagnetic location. Now we're not entirely sure of how the, the baby turtles are doing that, but we do know that they're sensitive to um, magnetic um, forces. So by putting, some researchers have put small magnets on the top of baby sea turtles' heads, and it does affect their movement patterns. So there's multiple cues uh, that these uh, turtles are using to find their way to, to the ocean. And once they get in the ocean as well, how they can navigate the oceans. Interesting, okay. Um, well, let's see, we've got, uh, Samantha had asked, can shading turtle nests help the turtles have more males um, and more turtles in general? Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Um, so scientists have done studies uh, in what we call hatcheries on these nesting beaches where they've shaded uh, a subset or a certain amount of nests and they left other nests unshaded uh, with very simple, inexpensive um, materials. And what they found was that those nests that were shaded uh, produced uh, more male turtles because the nest environment became cooler. Um, and in some cases, not all cases, produced more turtles, it's depending on which beach you're looking at and the time of year um, and location of that beach. So yeah, that's a great point. And that might be that, you know, which I should have mentioned earlier, I don't wanna to get too much into it. That might be one way if we do find that less and less uh, males are produced and also less and more importantly, less and less baby turtles or hatchings are produced scientists and conservationists may be able to go to these nesting beaches and essentially shade or even irrigate water down these nests uh, to keep them uh, cooler so they can produce the appropriate number of males to keep the population going and also um, a lar uh, to sustain the population with an adequate number of baby turtles. Great point. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, let's do, we'll do two more questions. So, um, will diseases spread faster due to warming waters, or as? Yeah, I mean, I would say yes and no. So it depends on which disease um, and which species that's impacted that you're talking about. So some diseases might do better in warm water. Some diseases may do worse in warmer water. Um, that's not my area of, uh, of expertise, but I would imagine that would be the case. Well, and that's something that um, we can also go and look up and, yeah. uh, and we can do some homework. Absolutely. And then a last question, what are predators to leatherback turtles? So what eats a leatherback turtle? Great question. So um, when they're small, when they're baby hatchling turtles, pretty much everything can eat the turtle. So um, I've seen uh, seabirds swoop down uh, and eat sea tur uh, baby turtles, uh, you know, even smaller fish, sharks. Uh, there's also crabs that uh, live in the, uh, um, uh, on the nesting beaches where these turtles uh, hatch. And they'll just sit there and wait for the baby turtles to start crawling toward the ocean. And they'll also predate on uh, baby turtles. But that's just, that, that's a nap that these turtles have evolved with all these predators um, at the same time. And so the reason why sea turtles produce so many eggs is that, the probability of a baby turtle becoming an adult is about one in a thousand, one in 2000. So for every thousand or 2000 eggs produced, um, one baby turtle will actually become an adult or a new mom and dad turtle. So yeah, lots of things eat leatherback turtles when they're small. When they get bigger, like the ones I showed earlier, there's not too many animals out there uh, that can eat a leatherback turtle. 
Um, I have seen some videos of tiger sharks in the um, uh, southwestern Indian Ocean off the coast of uh, South Africa uh, predate on a leatherback turtle. Um, but there are not too many uh, docu uh, documentations of um, incidents of, of leather, large adult leatherbacks being eaten by other animals, it's mostly when they're smaller. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, absolutely, well, fantastic. Um, let me turn on my camera again. So thank you so much for this talk. And I, you know, we've got a couple questions about um, how, you know, people can get involved um how kids can get involved and so um i think uh, we can probably follow up with something on our website um if we can give some resources um but thank you so much vincent for your talk we really appreciate it and we really enjoyed listening um about how uh fish and sea turtles are doing in this in this warming world so thank you very much and um let's and all right, so please stay tuned for a post webinar survey um, because we would love your feedback and for information on past and upcoming webinars um, or to receive a NOAA live iron on patch, uh, visit our website at Woods Hole Sea Grant. And we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in the new year in 2022 on January 5th. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.